Hello everyone, welcome back to Castle Goring, chatting with Lady C. Hello Georgie, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you Liu. How are you? I'm great, fantastic. Well, I am absolutely wonderful because we had our first wedding here since coronavirus. Yes, yes first today. And I have never done it before. Uh, but I represented the castle at the wedding. Oh, wonderful. Mickey and I <laughs> yeah. were there. Yes, Great. and it nice. was wonderful. In fact, I have a picture of it. Would you be able to put it up? Yes, uh, yes, on the, on the video. You could? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, lovely. Because they're a really nice couple. He's an RN, Royal mm. Navy, which yes. you might not understand, but uh, anybody who's British would. Yeah. Oh, and she's a lovely local girl mm -hmm. and Wonderful. really absolutely adorable couple with the sweetest baby. They were supposed to have been married in April mm -hmm. and it was cancelled. Oh, yeah, well. And it's it was reinstated today. So they've had their ceremony and then next year they're going to have a rerun of everything as well as their reception. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. So, Very nice. I was so, so pleased. Yes. <laughs> so, I do love a good romance, romance, I've got to tell you. I still love a good romance. And, and if you represented the castle, mm -hmm. for how many years of guarantee they get from you for their marriage? Oh, a lifetime. <laughs> a lifetime of joyousness. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The warranty of the lifetime. <laughs> now, I think this this time we yeah. have a fun set of questions, questions. Yes. don't we? Yes. And it's a, yes. This is going to be hopefully fun. Yes. So the first question was regarding that some people, and including me as well, were looking you and uh, were looking at you at some TV shows. Mm -hmm. the, where you were talking about royalty with other royal correspondents. Well, I'm not a royal correspondent, I yes, hasten yes. to add. Hasten I, to add. I said with so, other royal correspondents. I know, but, but I, yeah. that implies that I'm a ah, royal yes. correspondent. No, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm definitely not, not a royal correspondent. So, but so, so, go on, sorry to cut you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so there is the question, we and people don't understand why there are sometimes I mean, many times so nasty with you. Well, Can it's you... a very good question and I will be delighted to answer it. Uh, there are one or two royal correspondents and they are one or two who know what they're speaking about and are of a caliber of journalist which is desirable and worthy of respect. But the average royal correspondent uh, is, they call themselves the Royal Rat Pack. <laughs> Very aptly named because half of them are rats. They are journalists that are of a category of person that has no access. Mm -hmm. They're never going to have any access. They're always going to be there pressing their nose on the glass, looking at the action from the other side of the fence, so to speak. It drives them crazy that somebody like me, who's not a journalist, can actually parachute in and really blitzkrieg them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so they're jealous, honey. Well, I don't like using the word jealous, jealous, but if other people wish to come to that conclusion, that certainly they have a great deal of malice towards me, some of them, and resentment. And, you know, it boils over it. And But I've reached the stage where, you know, what they don't get is that the average royal or the average grandee battens down the hatches as soon as journalists 
and servants enter a room. So they think that, and they just get glimpses of the formal side of everybody's life. They never get glimpses of the private, informal side. Their main point of access is usually dissatisfied servants mm -hmm. who they bribe. But I'm here to tell you, having been brought up my whole life with servants, that the one thing that you're trained from before you can even walk or talk is to never say or do anything in front of a servant that you do not want broadcast on the street. Servants know a little about a lot and a lot about a little but they never have the full picture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely never have the full picture. And of course this, so, so with these smoke and mirror merchants, they're suck up merchants as well half the time, you know, because they're, they're so, they've got such bizarre attitudes that, you know, I don't even, I mean, it's a good question. Let me put it this way. The crossover between them and me is extremely limited mm -hmm. and has always been and will be even more limited with the passage of time because half the time they are chippy oiks and flotsam and jetsam. <laughs> and rarely, you know, who wants to swim in a sea with flotsam and jetsam? I certainly don't. No. <laughs> and so the, the less I see them or have to, anything to do with them, the better. Mm. And of course, what really burns them up is that I'm the one who writes the best sellers <laughs> yes. and it's my books that stand the test of time and theirs don't poor sweetie pies that is when they are actually able to write a book because sometimes they can't even string three words together so. <laughs> okay so let's let's leave them on the side and continue with our next more important, important and things. interesting yes. things. things. Yes. yes. So there was one as well question regarding the the Princess Michael of Kent and her accessories. So it was actually about the brooch of uh, Blackamoor. Yes. So we there was question regarding this and can you explain the history yes. about the Blackamoors and why why Princess Michael of Kent was attacked in the media for wearing this brooch? Well, I have to tell you, it's one of the few times that Princess Michael of Kent did not deserve to have her head lopped off. <laughs> well, I met her a few times and I have one of her book. Yes. I mean, she's very glamorous and, and nice. Flamboyant yes, and Yes, yes. And works Interesting the room. Interesting personality. Yes. Works the room brilliant. She's a very adept professional princess. Yes. And I rather hope that Meghan Markle will graduate into being a Princess Michael, yes. because I think that is going to be the apex of her achievement if she actually manages to achieve it. But I don't want to say too much about Princess Michael personally, because... Uh, we, we should focus just on the brooch. I want time. to focus absolutely <laughs> on the brooch. Yes. Uh, Princess Michael wore what is known as a Moretto Veneziano. It is a racially inclusive piece of jewellery that goes back hundreds of years from the days when Venice and the Moors were great trading nations and as indeed was Dubrovnik, your a part yes, of your yes, country. Dubrovnik, yes. And we'll get on to the Morcic. Morcic, yes. In a few minutes. In Croatian is called Morcic. Yes, yes, but which are slightly different from yes. Moreto Veneziano. They are representations of northern Saharan Moors. They are usually princes, 
Bey's Pasha's and what the brooch that Princess Michael wore is one of the most beautiful and elegant representations of the medium. And in fact, the manufacturer of the brooch came out very firmly saying that she was subjected to a grave injustice. It's not a racist act to wear a Moretto Veneziano. It is, you're giving the message that you are racially inclusive and you like racial diversity. Now, you will know, being Croatian, that there is an equivalent in Croatia. Yes. The Morcic. Morcic, yes. Which are the Croat version of the Venetian Yes. Moretto Veneziano. Insofar as I'm aware, the symbolism is actually somewhat different because Moretti Veneziano are actually uh, a symbol of racial inclusiveness and racial diversity and support for the inclusion of other races and other cultures within your own. While the Morcic celebrate a Croat a, a Croat victory against the Ottoman Empire. Is that all yes, correct? Yes, it is. I'm going to show everyone the present that you got made ah. for me because Leo got two Morcic made for me and yes. sent over. Now you tell them about Morcic. Yes. So that's one. So Morcic, how we said in Croatian, and is, the other, yeah, and this the smaller one. So th they are made uh, in Rijeka, its city in Croatia on the coast. So they are very, very well known symbols of the Rijeka of the city, and they they are made um, in celebration of the victory over the Ottomans, because by the legend, how they said the Ottomans when they were um, running away the stones fall on them, I don't know from where and how, and then just these turbans, what you can see, were staying out, you know. So they the, were buried, yes, yes, they were effectively buried yes, with, yes, in yes, stones. stones. And then to, to celebrate the victory, to celebrate the victory yes, mm -hmm. they start to producing this and the uh, people were wearing, mm -hmm. and especially people who were in um, navy or you know on the on the sea working mm -hmm. on the sea, they they wear the earrings mm -hmm. with the morchich, yes. which were giving them how they said protection and luck, you know. Good luck against yes. the evil yes. eye. Yes, but the but the Ottomans have not ever objected to... No, no, to, no. No. Well, it's very old tradition. It's, I think, maybe almost 500 years old. I think it might be more than or that, more, if I remember yes. correctly. So, and mm. they, are, they are produced just in Rijeka. You can't... Maybe you can find them in Zagreb as well, in some jewelry shops, but it's very They're produced rare. in Rijeka, Rijeka, and they're handmade. handmade. Yes, they're all yeah. handmade. Mm. And this this one, it's even made with the real gold, mm. coated mm. with the real gold. And yes, they are very nice. They're, and now, and in Croatia, people wear them, especially people from Rijeka, the mm. women from Rijeka, they, they wear them. They're proud of them. And they are, there's nothing tradition. racist about no, them. No, there's never been okay. any discussion about this ever. So. Now, the other thing I'm going to show, yes. aside from the Morchich, we go a bit more north because Venice is very close to Rijeka. Yes. Yes. So. And so the Venetian version, which is definitely racially inclusive, does not celebrate any victories against anybody, but is a symbol of racial inclusivity as a result of the millennium due over which the Moors and the Venetians traded. 
Yes. So you show this. So this is yes. This the is a slightly different one. It's 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 Venetian version. It's very nice. Thank you. It's yes, very it, beautiful. It's beautiful. Yes. And you see, you only need to look at and see that this is the not a slave that's being yes. represented. This no. is a nobleman. Yes, yes. You know, it's, it's uh, very beautiful. I think it's most likely a vizier or a pasha or mm -hmm. yes, or it must be some highly ranked or absolutely. highly titled person. Yes, because yeah. of such decoration of yeah. the brooch. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Yes, it's very nice. So I so rather hope a bit that different than so, creation. <laughs> so, so if. We managed to vindicate Princess Michael. Yes. That is an accidental. <laughs> <laughs> that is an uh, accidental uh, outgrowth <laughs> of, of really showing people that there are traditions of jewelry yes. with, where, that are interracial that have no racist overtones. Yes. Well, if Marie Christine doesn't like her brooch, we know a dress where she can send it. <laughs> if she's scared. <laughs> I, yeah, well, it's not often one feels sympathy for her, but one did have to in this instance, yes, yes. you know. Uh, although I also have to say, I could not help but feel that she's so adept at grabbing attention for herself, you know, mm -hmm. that she she out Megan Megan in that <laughs> instance. <laughs> <laughs> so now next question, Leo. So next one, uh, it's regarding the Jamaican Gleaner. Oh, your yes. Which we mentioned last time. Yes. 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 Several people have asked to see it. See, yes. So can we can. Can uh, how I can put the screenshot of the you can yes yes I can okay so can video. you do that yes yes because it's really very very worthwhile. Next question is, are you friends with Princess Michael of Kent? I will think you have common interests. And if you don't mind me being mischievous, I know there is a backstory uh, about Princess Michael of Kent, you, Margaret, Duchess of Argyll, and Crown Prince Alexander of Yugoslavia from the 80s, when he, were, when he first moved to London and you were asked to give a dinner party for him. Please dish. <laughs> when Prince and Princess Michael got married, there was a tremendous amount of opposition to her admission into the royal family in smart social circles. Princess Michael had rattled around from pillar to post uh, for quite a few years, and I will not go into any of the details beyond saying that most of the women who were in receiving lines didn't want a curtsy to her. Uh, but because I usually led the receiving lines because it's done by precedence and I usually preceded most other people, I would always curtsy to her and I would say to her, and I remember there was a famous socialite who will remain unnamed, uh, but her maiden name is a household banking name. 
uh, she and I were beside each other and she said, you're surely not going to curtsy to that. <laughs> so I said, absolutely I am. I said, you know, she's now a member of the royal family. I said, and it's a matter of respect for the position. I said, and I think we can give the girl a break. So I curtsied. And of course, once I curtsied, everybody else had to curtsy. Well, they didn't have to, but it would have been very awkward for them not to, so they all did. And this happened repeatedly. Well, fast forward a few years, and she's most likely by now popped out the air in the spare. Uh, I don't really remember. Uh, but the organizer of Alexander's party gets in touch with me and in touch with Margaret and says, oh, you know, it's really very awkward, but Princess Michael asked to see you the invitation list. Now, Princess Michael is the most junior member of the British royal family. Crown Prince Alexander is a crown prince and a king by right, if not in reality. And so he is the most, he precedes her by streets. And she has the temerity to ask for the invitation list. And she strikes out my name and she strikes out Margaret's name. And she says in that phony Australian accent overlaid with her Schwarzenberg great grandmother's accent. Uh, that uh, she, I can't have them here, they're too controversial. Well, a few weeks later, my dear, she's all over the front pages of the news of the world, stealthily creeping in, then creeping out of Ward Hunt's flat in Eaton Square. <laughs> <laughs> the irony, a friend of mine lived in the same building. And also, to just show you the complete farcicality of the whole situation, after Mary Christine struck out our names uh, and put not only Crown Prince Alexander, but the organiser in the embarrassing position of having to contact us, Mary Christine put the organiser and Crown Prince Alexander in the awkward position of not only having to disinvite two guests who had given him hospitality, but also she showed herself up in the most glorious way because the organiser went around London telling not only us, but everybody else, how he then approached the Gloucesters who, being more senior than the... Prince and Princess Michael of Kent uh, go after Prince and Princess Michael of Kent because it's reverse precedence in order of entertainment. Uh, and he offered them a copy of the invitation list and the Duchess of Gloucester, showing what a rare lady is like, said to James, oh, Mr. Dorset, you know, there's no possibility of Richard and I wishing to see Crown Prince Alexander's list. Any friend of his is a friend of ours. I have only ever once in my life been the aggressor in any situation. Once with a childhood friend of mine whose name is Suzanne Burke. And I learned my lesson then, and we are the greatest of friends now. And I don't attack people, but God helps those who attack me. I'm speaking about personally, because of course, as a writer, you don't attack, but you have a duty to speak the truth. So that's Princess Michael. I don't like her. I'm not going to pretend I like her, but I certainly recognize her qualities. She is a great professional princess. She works the room like nobody else does. Oh, she's absolutely charming when she wants to be. It also helps, of course, that my sometime butler was her 
so tight, <laughs> but no. So, so that's Princess Michael. I don't particularly like her, uh, but I remember somebody saying to me, a very well-known man, who sat beside her at dinner, and he said to me afterwards, he said, you know, she's so charming for the duration of the dinner, I forgot that I can't stand the cow. <laughs> <laughs> and that really is the consensus she is not very popular and she's not popular for the mere fact that people do not find her agreeable let's put it this mm -hmm. way she's too grasping for attention she's too affected uh, and she's too pretentious uh, I mean, she's the sort of person that you actually, if you gave her an enema, she'd lose at least three quarters of her body weight immediately. <laughs> so that's her. He is another story altogether. He used to go out with a great friend of mine when I was young. He went out with another friend of mine uh, who... He couldn't marry because she was a divorcee. Then, of course, Mary Christine managed to wangle it, uh, which was fair dues. I mean, you know, one cannot actually decry somebody's resourcefulness, and she certainly is resourceful. Uh, he's, and I have many friends in common with him, and... He's basically a nice man, and I can tell you something. He's paid the price for marrying her. <laughs> All I can say is I hope that Harry and Meg's baby end up having a marriage that is at least uh, as superficially agreeable as Prince and Princess Michael's. Yes. You know, but well, I don't want to say any more because I don't want to blow <laughs> anybody's cover. Okay, don't. <laughs> certainly not his. Yes. And certainly, and you know, she's a cow. Yes, but but thanks to, to Prince Michael of Kent, we met for the first time at one of his events at such a gallery. That's right. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I can remember the moment <laughs> that that you were wheeled over to me <laughs> yes. oh, as this delectably handsome prince. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, Lady Colin Campbell. <laughs> it was really, really nice event. Yes, it was yes. a very nice yes. event. Yes. It was. Yes. And he's a nice man. Yes, he is a nice man. And I'll tell you, their daughter Elle is absolutely lovely. She is so sweet because friends of mine who are friends of theirs, I've seen her at parties and she is beautiful. She's she's very much a Windsor. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, she looks like the Windsor side of the family and she is the Windsor side of the family. She's a really, really lovely, lovely girl. Oh, I know what it's like to have a difficult mother. So, you know, and I also know when you survive a difficult mother, yeah. how beneficial it can be to your character and your personality. And she has survived her mother brilliantly, really brilliantly. She also yes. has a nice father. Yes. So great. Thank you. Okay, since we are on royalty and royal family, let's stick then on this topic. There is another question uh, from Maria uh, McInnes. Um, have you ever met the Queen's sister? And if you did, what was she like? Oh, uh, yes, I did meet Princess Margaret. Oh, yes. uh, I first met Princess Margaret when she came to Jamaica mm -hmm. for Jamaica's independence celebrations, which was August 1962. 
she was ravishingly beautiful. She really was. She was so glamorous and had the bluest eyes and beautiful skin. And she just exuded glamour at every turn. And she had a very good figure. And she was just spectacular looking. The Queen was never as beautiful as her sister. The Queen was a good looking woman, but she didn't have that oomph factor that Princess Margaret had. Oh, that was the first time I met her. I met her around town, so to speak, there uh, once I started living in England. She, by then she was no longer young. Great, great friend of mine, still one of my greatest friends, is one of Roddy Llewellyn's greatest friends. And in fact, we occasionally used to double date when Roddy needed a date for something and Princess Margaret obviously could not be his date. I, on one or two occasions, was his date. So, oh, there's that link as well. Also, I was very friendly with Sarah Punsonby, who owned Serendel Farm. Oh, and in fact, there's a very naughty story about Sarah, which I can tell, because yes. I think it's safe to tell. Uh, in 1973, at my parents' house in Jamaica, uh, I had a dinner party to thank Sarah Spencer Churchill uh, for having had me to stay 2,027 times, sort of thing. <laughs> And it was, I think we had about 24 for dinner. And it was quite a nice thing. And after dinner, oh, sorry. And Sarah was seated beside Major General Rodolph Green, who was the chief of staff of the Jamaican army. At the time, he was my mother's closest friend. After dinner, Rodolph called me he said he called he beckoned me over he said georgie i need to have a quiet word with you so we actually went up to the swimming pool which was a reasonable distance from the house and he said georgie i have to tell you you need to rein in your friend sarah Pansonby." so i thought what's sarah done now he said <laughs> she said to me, would you like to come up to the pool and have a tot with me? So... Mickey. <laughs> oh, Mix, yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mickey, darling girl. Yes. <laughs> yes, you want to come and kiss me? Oh, best love in the world is mummy's baby <laughs> love. Oh, nice yawns. <laughs> yes, so he, he said that Sarah had effect well she hadn't effective she said oh yes baby girl you're, you're distracting mommy so sarah had had said to him would he like to come up to the pool and have a tot with him <laughs> and he said well oh, i'm afraid i don't understand what you mean and if he knew exactly what she meant <laughs> and she said oh you know i've got the most fabulous grass possible, she said. It's best ganja in the country. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, Georgie, I don't mean to be awkward, but do you think you could tell Sarah that next time she's at dinner, she's not to say to the chief of staff of the Jamaican army who's delegated with stamping out the production of ganja in this country <laughs> that she has really good grass. <laughs> so I said, oh, Rodolfo, I'm so sorry. He said, don't be. He said, you know, it's, it's life. He said, but really, she mustn't go around saying things like that. He said, you know, this is Jamaica. And it was in those days really terribly illegal. Yes. And, but I mean, Rudolph was a great guy. So that was Sarah Pansley. Uh, but Sarah owned Surrendal Farm, where mm -hmm. Princess Margaret used to go and stay. Mix, don't scratch. Mickey, don't scratch. Come on. Come. Sarah, Sarah owned Surrendal Farm 
which is where Princess Margaret used to stay, and John and Roddy and all of them lived in a commune. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, I was never into communal living. I was never into this sort of our ganja sort of let's be cool scene. I used to say when people said to me, oh, oh it's so, I used to say, no, cool is crap. <laughs> 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 Which of course then made some people think I was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I was never interested in, in pot smoking and all the rest of it, you know, it yeah. was never my speed at all. And, but so, but Princess Margaret, mm -hmm. who I'm not saying was interested in any of that, by the way, uh, but you know, she, it was a very hippie-ish crowd, but in a very upper class hippie-ish way, but they were all really nice people. Mm -hmm. They were kind, they were gentle, there was nothing untoward about them. And poor Princess Margaret was given the roughest ride possible because Tony Snowden, her husband, was an ace rotter. He was so cruel. He was really cruel to her. And I mean, I know his biographer, Andy Corsi, mm -hmm. and she wrote the most wonderful book about him. But I also know his family because I'm friendly with members of his family. And he was absolutely brutal to her, absolutely brutal. But he had big psychological problems because his mother had not been kind to him. And so he didn't like his mother. And in fact, a part of the reason why he married Princess Margaret was to ingratiate himself with his mother who incidentally was also a great friend of my stepmother-in-law, Margaret Argyle. Uh, so, but Princess Margaret, I liked her, such as I knew of her. I was never a close friend of hers. Uh, my desire to be a friend of Princess Margaret curdled at the point of calling her ma'am. I'm afraid I don't... I could not be friends with anybody that I had to call them. I just wouldn't be. I can be on cordial terms with them, but to be friends, no, not a chance. So, and I'm not saying that she wanted me to be a friend of hers either, but we did have many, many friends in common. Uh, people like Virginia Royston, uh, darling Victoria York, uh, who's dead now. Actually, so is Virginia. They were sisters-in-law. Uh, I mean, you know, this is going all the way back to the 70s yes. and 80s. And I mean, it was a, a very nice circle of friends. Very nice. I mean, Roddy's a really nice man. He's very correct. He's really decent. Uh, he's a really good guy. He is a very good guy. And Princess Margaret was very lucky to have Roddy. He, she really was. And the Queen actually thanked Anne Glen Connor for having introduced Roddy to her sister. Oh. That's nice. And they remained friends even after Roddy fell in love with Tanya and then married her. He and Princess Margaret were still great friends. She would, you know, they would go to the palace and see Princess Margaret. She, she had the gift of friendship, Princess Margaret. That's and nice. she's, she's not got as fair or as easy a ride as she should have got. Partly because she was a bit of a maverick and partly because there always is the fairy at the top of the Christmas tree and then there's got to be the foil. <laughs> and since the queen was the fairy on the top of the Christmas tree, Princess Margaret was the foil. And that's how it plays out with the press. The press, to an extent, like yin and yang. And 
it so happens that the Queen was deserving of everything that was said about her. But Princess Margaret wasn't. Mm -hmm. Princess Margaret was sometimes given a very rough ride. Well, she was very, I mean, indeed, interesting personality and person. And thank you for your experience, I mean, sharing your experience meeting her. She was also like all great ladies. Princess Margaret had the mouth of a sailor when it was called for, you know. She didn't mind the F word, but she didn't ever want anybody blaspheming. Yes. She was actually a much nicer, kinder, more solid person than she was given credit for being. And she was always very royal. Mm. Yes. Sometimes too royal. <laughs> oh, well, so anyway, so that's see. Princess Margaret. Yes, thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Please keep writing your questions and we will speak again soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Hopefully you will have enjoyed this slightly lighter tone. Yes. Do let us know what you'd like to hear about next. next. Thank you yes. so much. Yes. God bless. Thank you. Goodbye.